I think we've all maybe heard the line from Emily Dickinson that I dwell in possibility a fairer house than prose. And I thought it might be interesting to talk a little bit about imagination and to see the extent to which, you know, as a culture, we have separated off imagination from facts or from truth or from knowledge. And we've given imagination short shrift and made it seem, I think it's partly consumer capitalism, but we've made it seem as if, if you're relying upon imagination or you're using imagination or what you're thinking about is basically the product of imagination, then it's to be despised or it's to be made fun of or it's somehow lesser than the facts or the truth or whatnot. See, and some of this is very interesting. I mean, the word fact comes from factum, means to make. Right? But at, at any rate, I, I guess what I want to do is first talk about imagination and how vital it is, how important it is, and then see if I can't address how it plays out in in ways that um, we can recognize in religion and then even in science. But I think that the first thing would be that in everyday life, right, we we seem to only need the facts where imagination fails us. It's not the other way around. I mean, we're, we're so... And, and it seems like a truth about us, that is, the truth about humans is that they're creatures of fancy. They largely live in a world that's not the case. They talk about what's not the case, about what might be, what could be. And this is part of the way that the truth gets disclosed. Right? I mean, some of it gets very tricky, but let's just take some everyday cases. You know, your everyday case would be uh, two people, they potentially want to date or meet each other. So two people have their eye on each other and they, again, we use the expression, they fancy each other. See, fancy is such a beautiful word there. To say that someone fancies another person, it's to stress how much when you think about that other person, again, especially early on in the dating, but it's all the way through. I mean, it never disappears, but you can see it most clearly early on in the dating where a person will they'll set up a time to meet and suddenly they're thinking about what will the other person be wearing, what should they wear, and it's so f just filled with, with imagination. It's what will I say, what will they say, how will it go on, what, what will they do if I do that. I mean, all of these if and conditional kind of ideas, they're, just, they're, they're part of it. So take a job interview, you know, if, if you're there and you, you're, you, okay, I'm going to have the job interview. You suddenly start to think, what questions will they ask? How will I respond to it? And what will the job be like? And what will my coworkers be like if I get the job? And you're, you're thinking about what will my coworkers be like if I get the job? This is before the interview and even during the interview. I mean, when you're actually there, there are facts that you're using, but the facts themselves are shot through with imagined possibilities of, should I have said something else? What did they mean by that? Did they mean something else? And I think it starts to become apparent that so much of what we take to be reality is the product of symbols and of thought and of abstract um, images, fans, fantasies, you know, tr try to take, and, and there, there's so many ways to get at it, but, you know, if, if you say that questioning and thought are subsets of imagination, and that imagination, that, that, and again, we could sort of say memory in there, I mean, how, how is memory creative? Well, it's partly an imaginative process, but, you know, it's, it's as if you imagine with an open end and you sort of call that questioning, but, but questioning is really a kind of thoughtful imagination, right? That it's, it's not dealing with the facts, it's wondering about what might be the fact. And that, again, this sort of possibility is, is again, is part of imagination. I think... For many people, religion represents some of the greatest products of the human imagination. That these were robust, robust 
imaginative responses to the question, who am I? Where did I come from? What does all this mean? How shall I live? How shall I relate to myself? How shall I relate to others? And as science has ushered in criticism of religious dogma, which perhaps it should, right? I don't think we want to question that. But it's, for many people, I see it here on YouTube especially, they attack religion per se as if the religious wars and the crusades and the un unjust treatment of animals and the sanction of private property and all those things that we could point to in the organized religion, you know, the institutions of religion and the political forces of religion, but that's not religion itself. I mean, that's sort of like saying that, uh, you know, science is nothing but uh, chemical warfare and atomic bombs and, you know, new kinds of advanced weaponry. No, that's just part of science. I mean, science has made possible various forms of, of very powerful, powerful weapons, but that's that's just one aspect of what some people have done with science. I think we want to say science is so much more. I would want to say the same about religion. Religion is, it's largely a product of imagination. Now, that doesn't mean that it's not somehow part of the truth of who we are. See, I think people are setting imagination in contrast to truth. No, part of the truth is that we're creatures of imagination who partly live by their imagination. That is, we cannot be fed, we cannot, be, we cannot live by bread alone. Bread alone doesn't serve. I mean, that means that humans partly need the word. They partly need imagined senses of how things are. Now, I'm going to see if I can get at that more in science. Try to think just for a moment of all that you know about history and ancient civilizations and the world that's come before you and the, the prior presidents and civil rights activism and Martin Luther King. We just go all the way back to the ancients and Aristotle and Plato and we could talk about uh, the Renaissance and the medieval period and just you, you can hop all around and that's imagination. Now it's not nothing but imagination but Without imagination, you wouldn't be able to put together what looks like and what feels like a coherent picture of all of that. I mean, not only are all of the facts abstractions and they're distortions and they're selections and omissions and they're, uh, as Freud would say, condensations and displacements. There, there's so many different ways that the symbols that we use aren't the things but are selective, abstractive you know, partial representations that omit as much as they, as, as, as they convey. And what we get then is that the entire scientific worldview, all said, right, is it's a socially coherent, systematic interlocking of imagination. It's not that it's gotten rid of imagination or dispelled imagination. It's that science is the way that imagination has become harnessed and testable and socially interlocking in a way that we can replicate what someone imagined was the case and now we study that. I guess part of what I'm, I'm trying to stress is that there do seem to be products of the imagination that help us understand the truth about ourselves and who we are. And some of those imaginations come from more than the experience of suffering and the suffering of another. Certainly, you know, animals do experience great amounts of suffering. I don't think anyone wants to deny that. And our imagination of their suffering is part of the way that truth gets disclosed, right? And do animals suffer for the suffering of others? I think it depends upon the animals. We're going to admit degrees. Elephants, apparently, right, they have, we have heard stories, right? I think we've all have seen images and representations where we've heard about elephants weeping and elephant grave um, burial grounds. But this still seems yet not the level of imagination of the human, which is to imagine the holy not there. I mean, not simply love of the stranger, love of the other, love of the as of yet unborn or even unconceived person, but 
to be able to imagine future wars, to be able to imagine future devastations that may or may not be the case. I mean, we can worry about the kinds of horrors that could be part of the future, and that's reasonable. I think we do want to reason by the ability to imagine. But what I think we don't want to do is throw imagination out with the proverbial bathwater. It could be that imagination has been largely undersold in modern capitalist society, that the wily advertisers, they, although they spend billions and billions of dollars getting you to sit down in a theater and to give you something for your imagination to feed upon, and imagination has now become fantasy on film that people collectively and fantasize together, but the fact that you've had the gift, and I will use the word gift, of the ability to imagine, and that no matter what happens throughout history, people have been able to imagine possibilities, imagine a possible better world, imagine a world in which the suffering of others matters enough to them to see the derelictness of their own behavior and try to change the world for the better. Uh, I think part of the concern is, and this is a wonderful line, it's that literalism is the devil's weapon. Yeah, there's something very insidious about trying to be too literal about things that poetry admits to a kind of responsibility where prose becomes those are the facts they speak for themselves. The more that we're willing to entertain poetic statements, the more that we realize that in the ironic statements and the poetic statements, the metaphorical statements, the statements themselves can't be responsible. Only we can be. I think we imagine that the facts can be responsible. Thanks.